It's one o'clock on Tuesday, February the 22nd, 2022, and you are watching Science at So streaming live on Think Tech from downtown Honolulu. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today is Eleni Ravanis. She is a graduate student uh, within the Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Science at SOST showcases many of the research projects that both our graduate students and our postdocs are performing. SOST is the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. So welcome, Eleni. Really pleased to have you on the show. Um, first of all, can you just tell the audience a little bit, what do you do? What, you're a student, correct? Yes, uh, so thanks for having me. I'm Eleni Ravanis. Um, as you said, I'm a, I'm a graduate student, a second year PhD student in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Uh, I work with my supervisor, Dr. Sarah Fagents, and I'm interested in all things Mars. That's great. And hopefully the uh, fire engine won't break into your house. Oh, sorry. Right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, Eleni, uh, although you're only a second year graduate student at UH Manoa, you've had a really interesting early research career. Our topic today is missions to Mars. And I believe before you came to Hawaii, you were actually working on a different Mars mission. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So I was lucky enough to spend two years working for the European Space Agency um, for the Mars Express mission. Um, that's an orbital spacecraft mission. It's in orbit around Mars now. It was Europe's first mission to Mars, and it's been there since 2003. Um, so it's still going strong. And I worked specifically for, for one of the instruments on board that mission. Okay, and I think our first slide is going to show just a little bit about uh, what Mars Express was doing. So walk, walk us through, um, we've got many different images in this panel, including the spacecraft in front of Mars, I believe. Yeah, so that's an, an artist concept image of uh, Mars Express itself in front of Mars um, on the left there. And then in the top right corner, we have the instrument that I actually worked for. Um, and this instrument is really interesting because when Mars Express um, first flew, it wasn't actually designed as a science instrument. Um, so it's called the Visual Monitoring Camera, and it was actually designed to monitor a lander that went with the spacecraft, which unfortunately failed. Um, but the camera remained on the spacecraft. And then in 2007, some of the engineers um, at ESA decided, well, hey, why don't we turn this back on and see what we can do with that? Um, so the camera started being used as an outreach instrument so the public could get involved and kind of um, the team, the Mars Express team took images when it didn't interfere with the normal science operations. Um, but then some scientists in Spain at the University of the Basque Country in Bilbao in northern Spain found that um, they could actually do um, really good science with those images. And we can get into a bit more of what that science was later. Um, but long story short, this instrument is now considered um, a full science instrument on Mars Express. And you can see some of the example images from the VMC, as it's called, um, in the bottom half of that slide. Yeah, exciting images. Um, briefly, going left to right at the bottom, um, what is it that we're looking at? Yeah, so I picked some of my favorite images from, from this slide. So on, on the left, we have um, a cloud over Olympus Mons. Um, then we have uh, Valles Marineris, which is a huge canyon system on Mars, which actually would dwarf the Grand Canyon system on Earth. Um, then we have one of the polar caps in the middle. And um, then we have the polar cap with a dust storm over the top. And then on the right, it's covered by the Think Tech Hawaii <laughs> logo, so it's hard to tell, but just another image and, and of, of Mars and the great thing about this camera is how much of Mars it can actually capture in the frame so it's got a, a wide field of view which makes it really good for imaging kind of large-scale atmospheric phenomena on Mars. Okay and the, these are real images taken with I'll call it your camera because you work on the camera <laughs> That's uh, right, as right, opposed yeah. to the artist's rendition and when you said that it had a wide field of view I think the second image like if we've had the second slide, this is another view of Mars. Um, it's tilted on its side, I understand, so that the North Pole's to the left and South Pole's to the right. But this is the kind of um, view that the camera would actually obtain. 
Exactly. Yeah. So we, and it also depends when you take the when in the orbit of Mars Express you take the images. So we typically took the images at the point where the spacecraft Mars Express was was furthest away in its orbit from Mars, and that means that you get a really good view of, as you see here, kind of half the planet. So that means that you can image really big things that you might miss if you focus just on on one part of the planet, um, like this huge cloud over Arcea Mons volcano that you see here. Okay, and we've got uh, three dark spots uh, near the top center of the image. Um, and you mentioned Arcea Mons, which is a volcano on Mars. That's the one with the, the white cloud streaming away to the bottom of the image. Yes, that's right. And um, all three dots are, are well, all three things that you can see here are huge volcanoes on Mars. And it's, it's, it look, might look like this is um, something coming from the volcano, um, but, but, but it's not. It's not anything like an eruption. Mars isn't volcanically active today. It's a water ice cloud that um, happens to extend from, from this particular volcano. Okay, uh, and at the simplest level, the camera's a color camera, right? It takes color images. It does, so, yeah. okay, you, you can sort of uh, interpret some of the data from that camera system in terms of its, its color characteristics. But this cloud, which uh, you showed in the previous slide, um, is that common uh, or was this a new discovery made by your camera? So this was something that was really interesting with the VMC. Um, it was something that was noticed in, in 2018 um, by some of the, by the VMC science team. And then um, they actually went, well, we actually went back. There was a study led by Jorge Hernandez Bernal, who was my colleague um, at the University of the Basque Country. And um, he went back and looked through archive images of VMC and also other instruments um, on spacecraft around Mars to look for this cloud. And it's a phenomenon that, that reoccurs in a particular season, each season on Mars. And what was really exciting when, when, when I was working at ESA was, um, you know, we actually predicted that this cloud would come back so we could specifically um, plan observations to try and catch that cloud. And so then in 2020, it reappeared again and we could make observations and find a little bit more about how this really long cloud develops. So you think it's a weather cloud? Is it just when the temperature is right or the atmosphere is a little bit damp or something like that? I always thought that Mars had a very thin atmosphere that was basically quite dry. Yeah, so we're still working on exactly why this cloud forms, um, but using data from some of the other instruments, such as Omega is a, is a spectroscopy instrument on Mars Express, we can get some more um, detail about the, what, the, what the cloud is actually made of, because although the VMC does take, picture, take photographs in colour, you can't really use that colour information to find what the cloud is made of, but because it because we have the Omega data, we know that the cloud is made of water ice. So it seems that um, at certain periods of the sea, certain seasons on Mars, um, warm, warm air, warm, it's not very warm on Mars, air kind of rises, condenses, cools, and forms kind of this, this head. And then winds actually blow the cloud westwards and it can extend up to 1800 kilometers. So it's, it's a really big phenomenon that you can actually see with telescopes on Earth, which is quite exciting. Okay, and slide three, I think, shows um, a number of traces. Um, the, these colored lines, I guess, Arcea Mons volcano is at the bottom right, lurking under Think Hawaii again. Um, those colored lines, what are they? So their their observations that were made of different um, kind of during different time periods on Mars, and it's just how the cloud kind of developed. So from looking back at all these different archive images, we were able to to kind of trace how the cloud develops from kind of the early morning to dissipating before the mid afternoon, before the afternoon. Um, so that's why some of the other 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 orbiters didn't spot it because they tend to actually observe in the afternoon. Um, so these lines kind of just show how the cloud starts around the volcano and then extends all the way to the kind of top left of the image. Okay. And, and the scale bar, the whole width of the scale bar is a thousand kilometers. So that's about 600 miles, much more than the distance, say, between Hilo and uh, Kauai, just to give 
uh, viewers some idea of the, the size of this particular uh, set of clouds. And, and you know, you actually published, you were an author uh, on a research paper that described this. Congratulations, it must be great as a, a student to have a, a professional paper already published. Um, the fourth slide will show a little more of the, the details. And you mentioned that uh, most other spacecraft had missed the cloud. Uh, and this diagram I find particularly interesting um, explain to us what it is we're looking at here. Yeah, so we're looking at how the cloud kind of um, develops across the day and, and all these different colours kind of correspond to different, different time periods on Mars. So by taking that data kind of all together, we can see a trend and, and the cloud kind of expands in it in a linear fashion. And something else that we can look at is, is how, well, something that we're trying to look at, we try to look at in this paper and continue to look at is whether there's interannual vari variability between between how these this cloud develops over different years. Um, because, for example, with the the red dots that you see in the bottom, they were kind of early anomalies in the season of the cloud developing, and they kind of coincided with the waning of a huge dust storm on Mars. Um, and generally, as Mars scientists, we're very interested in knowing more about um, Mars dust storms. It's important for kind of understanding how they might impact future missions and current missions on the surface. Um, so this cloud was seems to have been affected by that dust storm. Um, and so it's interesting to kind of try and tease out a little bit more how that was affected and, and whether this cloud can be used as a bit of a proxy for climate phenomena. Okay, uh, uh, and the diagram again down the bottom, Mar Alciamon's local solar time. So that's right after sunrise. Yes, so it starts early in the morning. Uh, early in the morning. And the different colours where we've got top left Mars season, um, the red might be summer and the green might be winter or something like that. Exactly, yeah. Okay, great. This must have been really exciting, you know, sort of a, a, a new discovery and uh, you were working uh, with the European Space Agency. How did you feel at the time? It was really exciting. And, and, and what was great about working for Mars Express was because it's kind of it's an established mission. I was able to get um, quite a bit of kind of um, I had quite a lot of responsibility quite early. So I actually ended up being responsible for planning BMC observations on a monthly basis. So it was really exciting when this kind of the season for the cloud came along again, because I was responsible for kind of trying to get those observations that we could use in the paper. So that was really exciting. Yeah. And, and by planning, does that mean when the camera was turned on or what direction it was pointing in? Yeah, so the, the way that the planning works for, for Mars Express, at least, is you, you kind of plan uh, about a month at a time in advance. Um, and so you plan kind of all the observations that are going to happen in a month. And we have, you know, software that helps us do that. And, and, and mm -hmm. you find out um, how, how things will fit in um, in the timeline compared to all the other instruments, the right angle, what you're going to look at, things like that. Fantastic. Let me just remind the viewers, you're watching Science at SOS. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest this week is Eleni Ravanis. She is a graduate student within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. So, Eleni, this must have been um, quite a thrill for someone um, of your age. Why then did you decide to come to Hawaii and become a graduate student? It would seem you had a great career uh, building in Europe. Yeah, so um, I, I did my job at ESA as part of the European Space Agency Graduate Trainee Scheme, which is a really good scheme for, for people who have a master's degree. But I always knew I wanted to go back to kind of more strictly research. Um, and then this PhD opportunity came up in Hawaii and it was really appealing because it had involvement with another Mars mission, which is Mars 2020. Um, so I'm actually a student collaborator on the Mascam Z camera instrument on the Mars 2020 mission um, and I was really excited about the possibility of doing a PhD and doing that science research but maintaining involvement with an active Mars mission. Great well slide five actually shows Mars 2020 which I believe is called uh, Perseverance 
Um, exactly. This is a, a, an, an interesting image. Uh, what, what are we looking at here, Owen? Yeah, so we're actually looking at a, a selfie taken by the rover. Um, and yeah, you can see the rover itself, Perseverance rover. And in the background, you can actually see the Ingenuity helicopter, which also um, accompanied the rover. So this is this is made up of kind of stitched together several images, um, really showing the rover on Mars. Uh, I, I, I'm intrigued. How can a rover take a selfie? Um, I, I've seen the Chinese rover um, put a camera on the ground and then back up and photograph itself. But I don't think Perseverance can do that, can it? No. So actually, it's a camera kind of on the arm and, you know, some very clever engineering and stitching the images in, together in the right way. So the, what you see here is the selfie. OK, and a really interesting, you know, in the background, you can see the tire tracks or whatever the wheels have been uh, le leaving on the Martian surface. Now, you say that you are part of uh, a, an instrument team called MASCAM Z. I think the next slide will actually show where your camera is, and I refer to it as your camera. Um, <laughs> co coincidentally, I know the principal investigator for that camera is a former UH graduate, Jim Belk, if uh, yeah, I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is an artist's rendition. And yes, it, and it's correct. pointing to various things on the rover. Um, can you explain a few of these things? Yeah, so this is the science instruments that are on the rover. As you can see, Mascam Z is just one of those. So Mascam Z, we kind of refer to it as a camera, but it's actually a camera system. And you can see it kind of has two eyes up on the top of the of, of the cat of the of the rover, um, pointed to by those arrows there. And um, some of the other instruments that we have is, is RIMFAX, that's a ground penetrating radar, so we can see below the subsurface. We have PIXEL, which is really, it's, it's, an, it's really important for kind of seeing the um, uh, rocks at a really small scale. We have MEDA, which is a weather station. So we have um, a lot of different instruments on the rover that has, allow us to see lots of different things about Mars. Um, but MASCAM Z, as I said, it's, it's a camera system. It's a multi-spectral camera. That means that we can take uh, images in kind of the visible light, what, what we see with our own eyes. We can also, it also has filter wheels so that we, we kind of filter the light coming through so that we can kind of pick out particular things in the rocks that help us understand what they're made of and, and therefore kind of the, the geologic history that we're looking at in Jezero Crater, which is, which is the home of the Perseverance rover. Okay. How big is the rover? You know, is it like a a, a toy car or a, a two stories building? I, I have no <laughs> idea of the scale. It's not quite as big as a two story building, but it is big. It's kind of like you know, decent car size. Um, okay. So it's 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 a big piece of machinery. And it's been on Mars for how long? Well, actually, we just celebrated our one year anniversary of landing. So, so Perseverance landed on February 18th, 2021, last year. Um, so, yeah, we just celebrated our first first year anniversary on Mars. Congratulations. Thanks. And, and, and you know, what, what does it do? Um, our viewers may not be aware, you know, like it's got wheels. So does it drive around or, or what, what, what's the... Uh, part of the mission that you're involved in? Yeah, so the Perseverance rover definitely drives around. Um, so we've been exploring the kind of the crater floor at the moment. We picked the Jezero crater as, as the home for the Perseverance rover um, because it has a really interesting mix of geology. The thing that, that we're going to go look at next, and it's a big reason that we landed in this crater, is it has a delta. Um, and so a delta... Um, it occurs when you kind of have flowing water that then comes into a standing body of water. Um, and so um, we can infer that there was a lake in that, in that, in the crater. Um, and then the thing that we're going to, the slide that you just showed in the next couple of weeks, um, we're going to go have a look at, we're going to drive back past our landing site and we're going to go have a look at some more of the rocks. So actually for the past year, we've been exploring the rocks um, of, of the crater floor, um, which um, as you, if any of our viewers are interested, might have seen in press conferences, a, a 
primarily igneous in origin. Um, so igneous those, is volcanic. Oh yes, yes, volcanic. Yeah. <laughs> so so maybe like some of the rocks in Hawaii, and we've had discussions on the team, you know, comparing um, some of the rocks on Mars to to the ones we see in Hawaii, which is always exciting. Let, let let's go back to that uh, last slide, slide seven, and you can talk us through. Um, this is amazing. It's not quite like my backyard, but what an incredible view. Um, is this a single image or, or what is it we're looking at? Yeah, so we're looking at an, an image taken by the Mascam Z camera. And in the background, we can see um, Santa Cruz, which is one of the hills in, in Jezero Equator. And, and what we tend to do with Mascam Z is, I mean, I talk about a Mascam Z image, but we would take, you know, various kind of images and stitch them together to, to make mosaics is a common thing that we do with Mascam Z. Um, so we get this really interesting sweeping view and in the foreground we have some rocks called um it's pronounced chesh but it's spelled char it's a navajo word meaning frog um and these are some of the rocks that we're going to go explore next they're kind of dark big bouldery kind of blocky um, rocks and they look a little different to some of the rocks that we've encountered we've been encountering so far we first encountered them in the very early kind of days of the mission um, and then we went down south with the perseverance rover and now we're driving back up north so we're going to pass those rocks again so th this is a mosaic of individual images stitched together in a computer uh, yes i think so okay it's not I'm just trying to remember a, off the top of my I'm trying to remember off the top of my head if that's a single image or if it's the images stitched together but we typically we kind of take both yeah it would be remarkable if that was uh, an individual image um I don't know how many you snap each day but uh, it'd be a, it's a lot way. it's a lot it's a lot, a lot of images um um we were looking across the Martian landscape towards that hill um how far can you see on Mars you know it, it was that um, 10 feet away, was it a couple of miles or, or do you know anything about the details? It, oh, no. it looks really close. Yeah, it looks it looks close, but it's quite far away. I don't know off the top of my head how how far away this is, but I mean we can see when we're in the crater. Well, often sometimes we can see the crater rim in the distance, and 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 that's um you know many kilometers away. So we can mm -hmm. we can see like kilometers at a time. Sometimes we don't tend to kind of investigate that those quite that long distance. We tend to investigate the things closer, um, but we do get some really amazing views, like you see here. Yeah. And I know the Opportunity Rover drove over like 43 kilometers or something like that uh, earlier in the 2010s. But uh, how far do you think Perseverance might be traveling? Is there any prediction how long it might live or what its uh, range might be? Well, we have the nominal mission, which is which is two years, but um, we, we, which is one Martian year, two Earth years, one Martian year. Yeah. Um, but but the, it's envisaged that that will be extended. So the thing that we're going to do next is drive over to the to the Delta. And then who knows, really, we might be going for, for many kilometers to come. I, I certainly hope so. Um, and we can drive really fast with this new rover, which is quite exciting. We can cover quite a lot of ground in a short okay. space of time. Great. So you know, as we start to wrap up, Eleni, I mean, is this where you see your career uh, advancing and why? study in Hawaii if the spacecraft's on Mars, you know, um, what, what are your career plans and has Hawaii helped you uh, advance those plans? Oh yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, the great thing about being in Hawaii is it, there's so many locations which are can be considered like a, a we call it a planetary analog so the rocks mm. that we're looking at here we can we can look at them and compare them to what we see on a planet like mars um and it's really exciting being involved with the mars 2020 mission not just because of this mission but also because it's the first in kind of a series of mars sample return missions so the 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 perseverance rover is currently caching samples which will eventually be returned to earth and so it's really exciting to be involved in something that people are going to be looking at for you know decades probably to come okay and i believe caching means that it's taking a sample and just storing it on the spacecraft yeah. yes and then eventually so, those samples will kind of be put down somewhere so that another another spacecraft can come along and pick them up okay 
so eventually will you be hoping to sort of be in charge of mission operations or you're going to build your own camera because you've had two great experiments with mars cameras already <laughs> well that would be that would be wonderful but um yeah i'd really like to keep um being involved in science research and mission operations i really like having that mix um so so we'll see but i i would really like to keep being involved with all these exciting mars missions that are coming up yeah yeah the, the rovers in particular are, are fascinating and of course there are other orbiter spacecraft that both uh um, the US and the Chinese have. So uh, uh, Mars is definitely on uh, in the future, but um, people going to Mars, any thoughts on that? Well, actually the European Space Agency just released, um, I still need to give it a proper proper read through, but kind of a, um, a look ahead to, to when we might send even you know European astronauts to Mars and, and they were looking at sometime around 2040. So it might happen kind of sooner than people think. That would be really exciting. There's a lot that a geologist could do a lot, um, you know, just quickly by kind of like with, with their little hammer and, and, and looking at the rocks. So that would be really exciting, but um, we'll see. There's lots of um, robotic spacecraft coming up. Yeah. I know Elon Musk is trying to get people there uh, by SpaceX, for example. It would seem that someone with your training uh, and interest in Martian geology um, would be central for perhaps you know, landing site safety or where to drive once you actually get on the surface. So uh, hopefully your, your career will take off and uh, you know, you'll remember what you've done in Hawaii. Um, the camera PI of Jim Bell, you know, we often talk about how Hawaii has helped him. So um, good luck to you. Anyway, Thank let me you. just remind, let me just remind the, the viewers, you've been watching Science at SOST. I've been your host, Pete McGuinness Mark. And this week, our guest has been Eleni Ravanis, and she has been telling us about missions to Mars, and in particular, the two missions that she has personally been involved in. So, Eleni, thank you again for appearing on the show. Good luck thank in your you. career. And uh, we might even call you back in a couple of years' time to tell us some more Mars results. So, thank you all. And um, everybody, we'll see you again next week where we'll have a different graduate student from SOS describing her research projects. So thank you and see you next week. Goodbye. Thank you.